this is a, okay, first of all, I'm going to make a disclaimer. Vibash and I uh, were not instructors, as you can see that neither of these handsome men look like me and Vibash. Uh, these are the actual instructions, instructors of this short little workshop or tutorial. Uh, we were just uh, TAs uh, for this workshop that they presented um, at the Use R conference, so this was in July. Uh, but it was quite nice to work with them. The, 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 the slides that they produced here are really easy to follow and nice and clear. And it, it's, an, it's an introduction to what we're going to show you. It's not sort of in-depth, you but you'll have enough information to be able to go deep into it yourself afterwards. So disclaimer, these guys are the experts. Vibash and I are actually TAs and we're going to show, share with you what we learned with them. Um, really nice guys. It was lovely to work with them. So we also worked with... Um, some other, uh, you, so use ours, Mesopotamia, Botswana, and then these guys were also in America um, as well. Okay, so here's just the acknowledgement of that they use. All right, so there's going to be sort of three parts. The first bit is just about why you want to produce reproducible code. Then there's a little, and then there's some stuff that where you have to get involved, which is the second two bits, right? So how can I make my R code more reducible for myself and for others? That is the, the key of the workshop. Um, and this is just a little, a little cartoon. Um, and what I would like you to do now is just in the chat, maybe put a few thoughts on why code should be re re reproducible. Oh, it seems to be so, quite a hard word for so late in the evening. Um, you can say uh, for yourself why you would like to receive re reproducible code from others. And maybe even if you don't really have an opinion on that, do you do it or don't you do it and, and why not? Just so that we can have a little conversation about uh, quick, quick thought process there. So you can add in the chat or if you want to uh, actually talk, you're also welcome. Where is the chart? Mental health, I like that. Good reason. You shouldn't see. Track changes, it would take several months, exactly. You go back and you've forgotten project handovers, track changes. How many people sort of do uh, transparency? Yes. How many people uh, already work with, uh, I suppose you wouldn't be in the tutorial, maybe, but how many people already do quite, use a, do a lot of reproducibility in their code, or are you sort of like on the fence? I have a paper due on reproducing our papers. I like that. Collaboration. With a baby, Babalwa. I'm very impressed. Very, very impressed. <laughs> okay, so I think everyone agrees why it's important. So the so and this is a for an example and it's one of the the obviously comes through what you guys said there. So he has a old professor, hopefully none of us ever look like that. <laughs> uh, don't worry, don't have to start your code from scratch. You can reuse the software from the previous person on the project. Poor little PhD student probably are the instructions? Probably not. Is it commented? Probably not. Where are the files? Who knows? Okay. Um, and that's obviously terrible. You don't want to be given a project like that. But if you had, if you had commented it at, at the minimum and you made it properly reproducible, then such a thing wouldn't be um, so daunting, of course. Okay. So, and this is a nice little study um, that they, the instructors show here about, uh, so this is my screen is difficult to read. So there's a, a link to the reference at the bottom there on the right. Um, the studies are quite discouraging. So they did a, a summary of efforts to re, re, replicate published analyses and 
most can reproduce in principle, but it's not like the click of the button. There, you can reproduce where there might be some issues or differences. Um, can reproduce from the process data with some discrepancies. So the data there's an issue. We can reproduce partially with some discrepancies. Most of all, so you can see the bigger parts of the pie, so it's not, you cannot reproduce. And with these reasons, the data is not actually available. Um, the software is not available. The methods are unclear and different results. So software not available can often be an issue if it's especially software that you have to pay for. Um, and then only if people have the luxury of having that license, if it's a very expensive software, that's an issue. The methods are maybe a bit fuzzy and maybe the way you explained it is not exactly how you implemented it and you know sort of made some adjustments. You get different results um, for whatever reason. And I think as you can see, the, the biggest part here is the data not available. Now, this is obviously quite contentious because sometimes data is confidential and you can't share it. So that there's a difficulty there. Um, and I and I this, th that specific part, I thought we could also, you can put some comments in the chat because uh, you can't always share the data that you have because it's confidential or, you know, you've, you've worked with a corporate and um, you, can't, you can't actually share it, you're not allowed to. So in that case, you, the journal couldn't reproduce your code because they don't have the data, but maybe there are clever ways of doing that. So maybe just in the chat, if anyone's got some uh, thoughts on data not being available, should we always share the data, even if it's confidential, should there be, say, maybe confidential clauses with the journal or wherever you're sharing it, that it stop, stays there, it's only for the reviewers to check it, it's not for general use. What are your thoughts on that? Sorry, try to get back to my chat. Ah, the bash is that Ted talk about the data or the or the reproducibility. No, it's like a reproducibility. Oh, yeah, so you can make the data confidential. So Lisa, this this is an example where I would have a that data that you're talking about. I would have an issue with that. So I do spatial, spatial statistics and I need your GPS location. Otherwise, I, I can't really do good analysis on it. So if I had the data, I would need the, I would have to have the specific location to do it properly. And then, of course, if I'm going to publish that somewhere, then the reviewers would want to replicate it and they would also need it. So then you get, you know, you get an issue with that. Um, there. And that, another example, I'm working with COVID data, South African COVID data through the NCID at the moment. Um, which I can't share a bit for obvious reasons, but we have it at the ward level, but no one can see that. So if we want to publish something on that, which we're allowed to, we can't show the, the true data. You have to think of a clever way to represent it. But then if I wanted to publish it and I wanted the reviewers to check it, I couldn't give them the data. It would be impossible. So there's always issues with that. Anyone else got any thoughts about data, data sharing? If you think of, here we go. Uh, so Maria took part in machinery context to predict which customers would order from me and the GP corners were altered for privacy. Okay. So like randomly altered or just, yeah, so I suppose not the exact location, but still so that it's representative. Standardized. Can we standardize data? That could also be. Is it not good enough to tell others how they can request the data from the source? Then you share your cleaning files. Yeah. I hear you, Maxine. But I think so. I think in, in, in like in statistics, I think it's difficult because we're really working with a raw, raw data when you're building a model. And if you can't share it, then they can't check. So, and, and I wanted to, uh, there's a, there's a journal called Spatial Stats, which is one of the big spatial statistics journals. And there's a Professor Pabesma, he's quite a big guy in spatial stats. And I was at a conference last year when we could still travel around the world. Um, and he, he gave a plenary talk then. He actually said one of his big issues when he gets asked to review is if he can't replicate it, he just refuses, he just rejects it straight out. Um, and it's not a policy of the journal, it's a policy of him. And it's not wrong because you want to have, you want people to do good science and 
I think it's very valid uh, at the moment with COVID for people just getting studies out very quickly and maybe too quickly and no one can verify. Uh, education data linked to ID numbers, yeah. Uh, so difficult, Sunry says difficult to predict without the great GPS, random, yeah. Um, so I would imagine San Marine, something like that, if you, if you took all of the locations and you moved them by a certain amount so that you couldn't predict them in to the free state, for example, if it was just some, you know, not on a, not a GPS or coordinate, but on an XY frame, and then you could still compare them spatially to each other, but not too specifically where they were. But it depends what um, question you're asking from the data, that that might not help you. Yeah, Helen says there's an argument that government funded research should be publicly available as long as it's personal information is privately funded. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if you've seen, there was, um, I think it was an MRC, they made a big call with regard to our COVID data that the government's not sharing it and it's not right because it's public data. So obviously you don't want information in the public that this household has a COVID case in it, that, because that's, you know, that's personal. But you do, the, gov the, the country should know in my ward how many cases there are, but they don't want people to know that. It's, there's quite a lot of politics involved. And I, but I agree with you, Helen, I think um, it should be exactly as you say. Okay, so that, is that it? Right, so, but I think we can all agree that it is better for our results to be reproducible. For science and um, also for project management and passing it on to other members in the team, etc. Okay, so this slide just emphasizes that. So we've got: Are you only going to publish it so then it's not reproducible, which is probably where most of us are. are most of us are doing. Um, versus, if you've these are the different sort of spectrum of reproducibility. You could add your code in, so someone could run it. You add your data in. So at least you run your code. Maybe it's a generic type of method that doesn't rely on that specific type of data. Then you could put toy data in or something. Or you can share your actual data, which is obviously first prize. And then full prize here is linked in executable code. So it, everything works. People don't have to um, wait. Okay. Um, and then full replication is your gold standard. So as you increase here, you get towards the best. Okay, so tips. So this is a cute little analogy that they made here about a team working on some code and everyone has their own way of doing it, right? Um, so you each, you'll, you'll be told to do the same task, but each person, especially with code, will go and do it in a slightly different way, whichever they way, whichever way they feel is optimal. Um, and one, one example, I think this is very important. I always tell my undergrads, they don't like it. They want memos for the code that I give them. And I say to them, you can't give you a memo for the code. You code like this, you code like this, you code like that. And that's fine. Uh, as long as you can explain to everyone and you can put comments in. Um, because everyone has their own style of coding. And R also allows that flexibility to sort of have your style in your code. So if you have a team where everyone is doing something differently, they have the same action to replicate or to code then you get different ways of doing it. Okay, so the recipe is, uh, is the same, but it's got variations in it. Okay, so you might then get different outcomes, even though you gave them the same task because of the variability in humans. So he uses a cook as an analogy for this. So you've got a whole lot of cooks. There is a recipe, but they each follow it a different way, and you end up with different outputs. Okay, so how can we make this more standardized? Right, so combine the instructions, results, and the interpretations. They should all be together. And then you have one unified approach. Okay, and that's what this package um, is, Workflow R is designed to do. So it's a package to help you uh, put this all together so that it's nice and reproducible. Okay, so the literate part of it, the literate program, is that they enforce or suggest that you should use R Markdown, okay? Uh, for any of you who haven't used R Markdown before, I find it incredibly nice. So what's nice about it is that you, you write in like a report, so your code, your code is in little code blocks, and then your, the stuff you write is in between. So it's not like just a .r file where you just have code and you have to comment. 
you can actually put descriptions and explain what you're doing in between the code blocks. Um, so this helps the, whoever's going to be given your code to understand what's going on. Um, so that's the first thing is that you have to be using R Markdown for this package and all your stuff should be running through R Markdown. Okay. Um, and R Markdown is built on these two packages here. Oh, I must tell you a funny story about uh, the instructors. I think the bus will remember. So as we all know, you can get these little stickers of the various R packages. So he was very excited because he had all these stickers printed for the actual use R conference. And he said, he told us all the, the facilitators and the TAs, he'll, he'll post them to us. We must just send us, him his, our postal addresses. So I said, there's absolutely zero chance it will get to South Africa. You're welcome to try. But, you know, so that was, we could have all got some of these stickers, but alas. Okay. Second thing is you record your changes. So if you go into this R markdown file and you make a change, you record it so that the next person that comes in can see what you've done. So instead of the naive way of doing it, which is probably where I sit right now, it, you know, you change your file name to V1 and then V2 and then V2.1 and you just save it like that. But what, what happens when you forget to resave it and you've worked on it and it's saved on the old version? So it's very inefficient. That's very user dependent and obviously we know we all make mistakes. So it will be better if you have a nice unified system where actually record your changes and you can say what you changed. I changed this. So also if, if in the future you want to go back because you realize, oh, that was the wrong part to go down. I can go back to a previous version that I know worked. Okay. And this, um, for example, increase baking time, replace the butter with the margarine. So they work through the recipe and they're making certain changes, add more sugar, not sweet enough, etc. So those are in terms of the baking analogy. Okay, and this is done with, with Git, which is a version, version control software. Um, and that's why we wanted you all to make sure you put your uh, a GitHub account. And you can see uh, you commit your code and then you say what was changed as you go along. So there's a record, especially if there's a team of people, there's a record of who changed what, when, and we can revert back to a previous version if something's not going right. Okay, so you've got all your recipes on GitHub. That's the idea, version control. Okay, and then the, the, the most important bit in reproducible coding is relative instructions. And I'm sure Priyanka has experienced this when we uh, give our students practical tests and then they save it and, you know, in their path, they have this whole long path on their computer. And then when I open it to test it, I have to go and edit everything to be able to run it. You know, that's not a relative instruction. So, and he gives an example here bake the oven on the fifth rack. Okay, maybe your, maybe one oven has five racks and maybe some have seven, which is crazy, like for example. So when you say fifth, is it from the top or the bottom? Or, you know, that's not, a, that's not a, an instruction that's going to be interpreted the same as everyone. So better would be bake the oven on the bottom rack because everyone will have a bottom rack. So that's what we mean in terms of baking of a relative instruction. But in general, in terms of coding, that is, this can run on anyone's computer, don't make it that it's specific to your computer or something that you do. Yeah, and yeah, it's exactly what I was talking about. So you're reading a table, here's your job, this is John's Dropbox. If you try to run that on your computer, that's not gonna be there and that's gonna cause an issue. So rather just the data and the raw text and you'll see in the, when we look at the, the example, we're gonna work with an R project because that then you can use proper relative parts instead of parts like this. Don't do that. Okay, and then also randomness. So in terms of baking, add a dash of salt versus give me 100 numbers sampled from a standard normal distribution. Okay, and the most important thing um, he talks about here in the package is that you should set your seed so that if someone else runs it, the same thing is happening. Um, Okay, so record your tools and ingredients. So what types of pots and pans, what were your ingredients, the names of the ingredients, the expiration dates. So this has got to do with what your system settings were. So that if someone, say you say in your paper that it took so, 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 such and such a time to run and they can't replicate it, that's because they know your system was set up in a certain way. So it also does that. So it's really all the information possible to reproduce is in place. The operating system, your version of R, your version of the R packages, all of that is recorded. This package does all of that for you. So it's really nice. So 
So you use the function session info to do that, and then it will record that for you. Okay, and then clean up. You insist you've got to clean up between cooking. So if you went to go work on something, you've committed some changing, clean up everything so it doesn't mess up. And um, there's a little cute little uh, way to do that. So don't save that workspace image um, in, in, in your uh, um, R project because that will also uh, result in not re reproducibility. Okay, because you can have other variables and things in it. Okay. Um, so never save the workspace to, for this, for this um, package. Okay, so workflow R is a package for automated reproducibility and there's its little sticker. So it, it makes use of some of the things I've discussed now is basically summarized here. Literate programming, so that means your R markdown. Okay, that's not just code, it's a nice, nice literate way to put your code with your comments in between, which are not hashtag comments, they're actually nice words and sentences. You can also in R markdown, for those of you who haven't used it before, you can write LaTeX equations. It's very, very um, nice. Uh, you control your versions with Git. And then you host it on GitHub so that it's accessible. You can then share that publicly or privately so it's really reproducible um, code. Okay, so organized, reproducible, shareable. So shareable is the GitHub data science in R. And so that's there, obviously there, a little slogan. Okay, and this is just what I just said. So your literate programming, all the analysis done in R Markdown. You've got your version control. It, and interesting, what's cool here, you would have thought it was just tracking your RMB, but it also tracks your HTML, the knitted files. Okay? It warns you if you don't use relative paths, you have to set the seed. So it will always do that. See, sorry. And it records your session. That's your session info function. And it always runs in a clean session, so it doesn't save that workspace. So when you reopen it, you don't get some funny things going on. Uh, can I just uh, add here? Yes. So the initial part that Inga showed you, it's a lot of things to remember. So what Workflow R is actually trying to do is take away that burden from you. You don't have to remember to set the scene. You don't have to remember to record your session info. You don't have to remember all of these steps. It's trying to get you to only have to concentrate on your actual analysis. And it takes all that heavy lifting and does it for you. Exactly. I just want to add that. Thank you very much. That was in my head, but it didn't, my mouth didn't come out. <laughs> okay, so it gives you, uh, so when you will see how to set it all up now, but it gives you all these checks. So it gives a reproducibility report. This appears in your little R project, but at the bottom. And then you can see, you can check the things and it'll tell you everything's fine. So you, if, it, if one of these is obviously not working, you can go and, and you know, uh, check stuff. Okay, you can also check your past versions. So it, and this is in your, your um, the little website that you create, which you'll see now. And then you can find your previous versions and they're all saved there on GitHub. Okay, don't stress too much if this is now, this little demo was overwhelming because we're going to get into it now and then you'll uh, understand it better. Again, these were just the little icons that he's used in the presentation, so he was just giving credit. Apparently, this a cute website with all these little things if you think it's going to be. Okay, so now we're going to do a little challenge. See if you can uh, get the idea of it. Okay, so it's super easy to write code that runs on your computer, but then it doesn't like rerun on another. So this little challenge, and it's really not difficult, so please don't think you have to be the expert in, in coding or anything. They're really obvious things, and we'll, I'll help you as you go along. You have to try and find bugs, um, and they're exactly the type of problems that workflow automatically fixes and warns you about. So that's the idea. Okay, they're really, really easy. So you can open the uh, cloud project, the other link that uh, Vibash shared there in the chat. And then when you open it in rcedo.cloud, just click on save permanent copy so it saves to your R cloud. So you should,
can you guys still see my R Studio? Is it still sharing? Yeah. So if you open it, it should um, look like this. And then just click on save permanent copy. So you'll have to log in. That's why you need to log in to rstudio.cloud. But if you go by that link, then it will open here and then just give it a bit of time to set up. Hi, Babalwa. Samari, I see you have a question there. We can, we can see if anyone can help as we go along. Okay, so this is a. Okay, so the, the our project of open is about Spotify songs and they just want to classify them. Okay, so don't freak out, you don't have to know anything about machine learning or anything really like that. Um, but you can go and look a little bit more about what it is, what the analysis is here about this Kalen. She wants to classify Spotify songs based on their characteristics like tempo and danceability. So obviously she's got a data set that looks at all of that. And then can you predict the genre of the song? Okay. So the, in the code, you'll see that it imports the song data, it then splits it into training and testing, which is what we do in machine learning. Uh, then it builds a tree model to classify it. And then you assess the accuracy um, using the test set. Okay, and then as a fifth step, you'll see in the last chunk of code, they compute the accuracy based on random guessing. Okay, so it's just, don't stress about the real machine learning bits of that. If anyone has some fancy things to add there, that is great, of course. Okay. So if we go here, so the idea is you must open the spotify.rmb. Okay, and then you don't have to do anything. Just click on the knit uh, button and you're going to see you're going to get some an error pop-up. Okay, you can see that. Okay, and then in the chat, if anyone can give a suggestion of why that error is popping up. Or how to fix it or you can speak that now and also uh, let us know if you're having any trouble with the r studio cloud is there anyone who's not with us that hasn't got r studio cloud open so we can just do or, and and the project visible like my screen looks okay lisa and maxine are on it here Okay, so what are we going to, uh, so the area's obviously got to do here with this read.csv, line 18, so you go to line 18. What should I change it to? Uh, Priyanka's way. <laughs> yes, just right here, so this is, an absolute part, so we should just take that out. So if you take it out in the read.csv and you just make it spotify.csv and you knit it, that one will disappear. Okay, and then the next error is on line 38. So if you rerun it, you should get something what, uh, similar to what I've got there now. And then there is something wrong with this line of code. Library, so what library do you think I should add in there? So uh, just a comment as well, for anyone who's not worked on rstudio.cloud, what's really nice with it is all the packages are installed automatically. Yeah, so you don't have the 
um, issues sometimes that you have on your own computer. So everyone says the package R part. So let's see if that works. It can help if I only run one block. You just mix it properly. Okay, yeah, so that one's gone. Now we're on. So, okay, maybe we can just, how did everyone know that that was the library package? So you'll obviously have to search and find where this function, what package this function belongs to. And then you'll, you'll if you do a little bit of search, you'll see that it belongs to a package with the same name, okay, as the function. Okay, now we're on line 63. Yeah. It says it doesn't know. Predict guess, which is, you can see it over there. So what should that be? What's going on? So when it says object, predict guess not found, that means it was never created. So maybe someone uh, worked on the code before and they changed a the variable name. So this, and if you, if you glance up in the file, you'll see there's no predict guess, dot, uh, predict guess anywhere. So what do you think it should, what should I replace that with in terms of As I tell my students, I'm not giving the answer, you have to give me the answer. <laughs> yes, Priyanka, thank you. So there you see, obviously it's some previous version of the code, this was maybe a guess here. So guess and random, you know, uh, this one is quite easy to figure out because they use similar words. Maybe someone who writes a little bit more uh, with random variable choices, just like X, Y, Z, A, B, will be more difficult to determine. But yeah, it should be random. Okay, and that sort of error would obviously require a little bit of understanding into what we're trying to do in this code block. So let's just see, there we go. And then now it emits without any issues. And then you put the nits of HTML5. Okay, are there any questions on this bit? Everyone. Okay, so as the slides say, let's go back here. Let's go back here. So the idea is we deliberately added column er common errors to make the analysis difficult. The goal is to fix them, right? And these are the errors that you might make um, to make the code non reducible but reproducible. Okay, so this is exactly what. What we just did okay and in the workshop we had a little breakout room so it was quite cute and then you can go in that little breakout room so you can ignore um the screen there's your absolute path a missing package and a renamed uh, renamed variable okay now my son just wants to say good night hi <laughs> Okay, what's the question? Yeah, uh, would this work with desktop? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Priyanka. Okay, so now you can su successfully run the analysis and exit the break room and re enter the main room. Okay, so how did these errors happen? We use an absolute path. So if it was run on a second machine, it would not work. So therefore, use workflow R. There was a missing package, rename variable. Again, you would. Um, Restart your R session often. Why? Because when you're running stuff, then you not necessarily part of that, and then it's an issue. Okay. Can you hear me still? My computer's telling me something about my microphone. Okay. All right. So now we're going to create a workflow R project. This was just an R project mission. So again, it's going to be a little exercise. So we want to convert the Spotify analysis into a reproducible, shareable website. So it actually comes to a website that, and you can share that link with people about your project. OK, 
Okay, and you can ignore obviously all of this about the same breakout groups. Okay, so now I'm going to, now I want you also just to follow along. You can follow on with the slides and I'll do it as we go. So in your um, R console, so in R Studio, So if you go back to our studio, yeah, in the console at the bottom, you can, um, the code that you see now on the slides, you can run there yourself. So the first thing will be to run library work low R. Okay. So you can do that so now. Mm. No, you must have to keep my people. Nice. <laughs> We can multi-talk. <laughs> okay, anyone have any issue there with that library? Fun? It, should, it shouldn't give you any issues. Okay, then the next slide, I'm just going to leave it like this so that I can go through it easily. Now you have to configure Git if you haven't already. So you can literally just copy, copy this code and paste it into your R Studio here into your console, and now your username. So you put yours in there. Yeah, lucky you were no errors. <laughs> Let us know if you guys are following along or if we are going too fast or do you have any hiccups. Um, just pop it in the chat or unmute yourself and let us know. Anyone, is this function maybe not working for anyone? Anyone having an issue? Still following Maxine, excellent. Just going to give another minute just to check everyone get this because if you if it's not configured you won't be able to complete this if you go okay is there anyone that's uh, a little bit behind maybe you can just say give me 30 seconds in the chat so we know Take that as everyone's thought. I'm here. There we go. Okay, we'll just wait. Wait a little bit. So the first bit in the, so in the console, you just run in library workflow.r just to set that up, and then the next bit is to do this configuration statement, also in the console. So you see why it was important to know your username. Otherwise, it will not work. Okay, anyone object to me going to the next slide? Okay, so the next one is to start your project. So you're going to run the following in your console. So again, you can just copy, copy it and paste it. And you'll see what happened was here it added uh, your 
uh, extra folders that were not there before. Maybe you didn't notice that they weren't there before, but they are there now. And you can see it says, so this is the start of your workflow. So files were added, it made a project name, um, you're working directly, changed so that it's um, your relative, you've got a Git repo, and your files were committed, and it's got a little fancy version. Did everyone, can everyone run that? Any issues? So you're welcome, you do have the slide, so you're welcome to um, move ahead of me if you're getting bored. Okay, now you're gonna run the following in your, again, and this builds the website from the default RMD file. It's currently in that analysis folder. and then you'll see something happening on the right hand side and now you've got this viewer okay and it's got a little there's the the title of your project you've got workflow r and this is where if you click on it you get these little tabs that you saw in the slides so if you click on checks you get that obviously there's not much going on here so but our markdown file update and a, a version um, in your summary you've got the date um, and just some basics. Basics, they're all default settings and then fast versions. So we only have the one, so it's only got the one and you see that version number is that this one is the same one from there. Okay. Please, please shout in the chat if you want us to give you a minute or even help you with something. No questions or silly. Okay, and this is this look here, this viewer that you're looking at is effectively a little website that they're talking about. Okay. Now we have to um, move the Spotify files to the workflow R project. Okay? Because remember we had it we had it in its own R project, so we're gonna move it into the workflow project. So you're just going to run these file rename things. Ah, functions. Yes. Okay, why? What happened there? Because I moved it. Okay. Um, and so that one that I had open is no longer where it was. So if I leave it open, it's going to be confusing. If you now go to your files, you'll see in the analysis folder, you've got that Spotify file now. Spotify.rmd. Okay, and in the, the other thing we did, If you go to the data folder, you've got your Spotify.csv. Okay, and we removed the Spotify.html because we knitted it previously. So this this is the structure that Workflow R1. So it puts it into this folder structure so that it can build. So it needs it like that. But there's a the workflow build, obviously uh, the start function that we did before, builds it like that so that everything's in place. Everyone with me, is there anything here that didn't run properly? Any errors? If anyone needs a moment, um, yeah. we are, we're happy to wait, so just shout. Yeah, got time. See, Vibash and I are now experienced TA, so we know how to help all the little things. <laughs> we try. We try. <laughs> okay, so then the next slide, you're going to, you guys are pro, yes. <laughs> okay, for the reproducer challenge, you change the path to Spotify as a relative path. Um, so just go, 
uh, but now this one is moved. Okay, I mean, we just moved it into data. So if you go back, so if you open again, your, if you go to the um, Spotify.rmd, okay, which is now yeah, in analysis, and you open this one now. Okay, if you scroll down, you'll see it's Spotify.csv, but this is not in the same folder. It's not here, you see? It's in data, right? So it's, if you try and knit it now, it will moan. So you need to tell it that it's now in data. Just because of the structure of, um, of workflow off. Question. How do I minimize the research website so I can this this viewer, Maxine? Has it popped out? Okay, she figured it out. Helen, just say if um, it's something that you are struggling with that we can help you or if you're just behind. You can well we can go back. So just keep adding me into the chat if you need. Okay, so you should have changed that to data and then you will see now if you knit it, it won't know me. Knit snow cone. Okay, uh, but you'll see very cute, it's got a workflow R that's in it. It's not just a normal HTML, it's a adapted HTML with a workflow R package. Um, incorporated. Okay, the next bit, now you must build. Now you build it all together. So copy that code and put it there into your console again. And everything is fine. Okay, you might get a different response there because I did miss it already. But as long as there's no errors, you're on the right track. Okay, you see it only builds new or modified RMD files. But I already, already did that, so. Everyone okay? Okay, now we go to uh, Sorry, can I just interrupt yes. for a moment? Okay. Um, so you'll see that like the main um, folders are like the analysis folder. And then what it's trying to do is it creates like a data folder for you so that you put your data in there. And also in future, you may want to add images to your R markdown. If you're adding images, then you have to put it in a specific place. So it's usually uh, in this case, in the images case, for example, it would be in the docs, in your assets, um, like subdirectory, you'd put any um, images in there. So it's trying to make it so that it's structured, but yeah. all your analysis RMD files go in analysis, all your data files go in your data, um, and then it pulls the HTML documents and put it in your docs folder. And that's what actually is rendered on your site eventually. I just wanted to. Uh, Thank you. That. That's excellent. And uh, obviously, in the package documentation, you'll be able to see where you know where you should put what if you're not sure. Yeah. In the, yes. Exactly. So. Yeah, the bus just put a nice link in to the workflow R package. Okay. All right, so now th this is a little step to add a link to your Spotify analysis. So it's actually, um, so remember we created the Spotify.html file, so it will add, add a link. So, and now this doesn't go into the console. You'll see you must open the file analysis index.rmd. So if you open that one, so we go to analysis and you open this index.rmd. It's obviously a, a sort of default file there. 
and you can then if you need there just add the following line at the bottom of that okay so you just add it over so we copy the code correctly copy and then you just save that and then you you do this workflow build again in the console Okay, and now you will see this is added to this viewer. You will get that, and then it will go to that HTML file, which is the one that opened when I knitted it. So it's just a little link. So it's got all sorts of functionality like that as well. Okay, anyone really not following us and struggling in? Please, you're welcome to ask us to just step back a bit. I know the slides are very good, so it's quite easy to follow, but we can still get lost. Okay, and now we're going to actually, uh, so it's been added to your website, which you saw there. Now you can actually publish it. Okay, and you can see there, yeah, so publish in an RMD file, instructs work for R to version. So take note, this is a version of the RMB file and the results in HTML. Okay. So you can copy that code and put it there in the console. And then tell you what it's doing. And you see it's just want to scroll up there. Quite a bit of work, but you see it's editing these files as you go. And oh this is got a whole lot of explanation there. And then you've got your website. So you can go there and it's been built. Um, and if you see in the on the screen that uh, Inga is showing you, it says like the following files were included in commit 51 FC. So that's the hash code for the actual Git repo that it's writing to you which is still currently local. It's on your actual RStudio project in your file. Yeah. Okay, and we're going to still put it onto the tab you'll see now. Okay, everyone arrived? Yeah. Right, so now we have to go and actually create a repository on GitHub to put this in. So you can copy this link and go to GitHub your GitHub and log in. So if you follow that link, it will allow you to create a new repository. So for example, and once you've done that, you should get something like this. So I've already created it and I've got my username and I have that name there. Okay, the, don't put the little uh, speech bubbles in the name, right? In, in, otherwise it's going to be confused. So you go to GitHub and you just copy this and you can see what it's going to look like. So you'll get a page like that. And then here you're going to uh, put that Spotify workflow R dash Spotify. And then once you fill that in, you can create repository. Give us a shout if you're done with it. I'll give you a minute or two. Please do a little bit behind. Lisa, you could just follow on the, the slides from wherever you left and just copy and paste. Just shout if something is not clear. So we're all on this, um, we're creating a new GitHub repository 
page. So we went to getup.com menu. Anybody done this and they're, they're with us? You can also just say, we're good, good to go. Good, thanks Priyanka. Lisa's back on track, done really good, good. All right, okay, no one else is telling me that they're striking, so. So now you should all be on GitHub and you've got this repository. And now you're going to connect your local R project to that repository. So back in R cloud, R studio cloud, you copy this code, okay, but you're going to edit it. So don't run it. So here it must be your username. Okay. So you would say, So you can take up the little triangle. What are these called? I don't know what the official name is. But you can take them out. Don't leave them in there. It'll get confused. Okay, and then now you're going to push with the R onto GitHub. So then you run this code. Workflow gets push. So we'll have to put your username and password in. So I hope you know your username. I mean your password. So we all know Inga's username by now. Hopefully I know my password. Hmm. Why is it moving? It might be because I've already put it there. I'm already making the thing. Yeah. Okay, so you shouldn't get what I've done because obviously I've done this before. Oh, I think so. Okay, and there's an, just an important note there on the slides. Um, this this function that you're going to run now tends to open the repository in a new tab. So if you have a pop up blocker, you'll need to allow it. So just check if there's nothing popping up on your browser telling you that. See, mine's last month in July. <laughs> Everyone managing there, is anyone getting an error? Anyone forgotten your password? That's all such stuff. Okay, so now we're going to in GitHub. So you can go to your GitHub and you can find this page. And you have to go, mine will obviously already be done. You need to navigate to your settings, which are there on, on the sort of right hand side. So you'll see them over there. Okay, and then you have to go down to this master branch and change, make sure that it's master branch docs folder. If you scroll down, um, on GitHub pages, branches. Am I on the wrong? Where should I be seeing this with us? Options. Oh, it's further down. Sometimes you just have to actually scroll <laughs> to get our pages. So I went to options and then scrolling all the way down to get our pages and then just make sure that it does in fact look like what I've got here. Mine's already been changed, but you must follow um, these instructions to change it to master branch docs folder. Everyone managing that? Let's see if we can just sort out this error. 
Did she sort in your ad with you for Bash? Okay. You can you can private message for Bash and she'll private tweet to you on the side. <laughs> Anyone else getting an error? Oh, she's chatting on the phone. <laughs> Multitasking. Okay. Okay, and then you can open your website that you have created, which is pretty cool. So it will look the following. So you've got to have your, so obviously your username there. Okay, so if we, Everyone knows my username now. Is that? And there you are. You've got a little website. So this is nice because you can share it. This is obviously the link to um, John's work. So if you click on I need to do something with Basha on my own. Let's see. Oh, you'll have to. Okay, that's where you have. Devon, did you also sort of like this for Basha? Or am I doing, did I do something incorrect there? Okay. Anyone else? The Lisa says so it's also next to that. Uh, I think the reason is we need to have more information is maybe you want spotify.html. Oh, I think it's the index that is the index. Yeah. yeah. I put mine in the you chat index. if you want to. Bushes looks all fancy, but then you can get so you want this one that we saw in R. I've obviously not set up mine for it somewhere, and then you can get all the analysis there. So, this is a way you can share um, in a paper or while you're working in a team, any of those types of. Um, let's see, yours has also got the error 404. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right, Maxine. It might just be that it does take a few minutes to see if I... I think it's maybe, sorry to honor yeah. Birk, yes. to interrupt. No? I think if you scroll down in the settings, uh, you in, have to in, go... In GitHub. In, in GitHub, you have to click on master, and then the sub, it says root or docs. And I left it as root. But if I change it to docs, it seems to do something. So mine, mine is yeah. on docs. It has to be on docs because yeah. that's that's the folder that it's serving the it, site from. Exactly. Mine might hold on. I think mine could maybe be set up as private somewhere. It could be. Okay, is there anyone, does everyone get the same page I do or does anyone, okay, maybe it is just a, a time thing. Okay. 
Oh. Okay, has anyone else got um, the same as Vabash's one? Okay, Maxine's is working. Okay. Priyanka's, okay. As long as everyone's is working except mine, I'm completely happy. That's important. So if you, um, now you can compare the results. So this is important. <laughs> you didn't teach unless something does not go to plan. Exactly. Um, and we learn to wing it as lecturers. Okay, and so, and this is just to finish off, it's just showing, so now you can compare your results because obviously you've got, if you go down to your testing, you've got the, the, the value of the, the mean when you do the random guessing. So you've got some accuracy type of measures. Um, you can check the session info. Go back up. You've got your checks, you've got your summary um, checks. You've got your past version. So, the, so this is all visible because it's part of the website. Uh, and just to note on the slides, I think it says you will get this answer, the 0 0.16, whatever. But that was at the time of running the workshop. Because what it does in the background workflow R is using your date, the date that you are running it, as your seed. So it's going to give you all. You all today who ran it should get the same answer, but it would be different from what the slides are saying. Yeah. Okay, any, any, any questions? Obviously we've done, the, the tutorial is a very sort of overview, high level overview of the, of the use R tutorial. Um, but I think it's quite, quite nicely done because I think if it was more detailed, you would, you would get confused could be too, too overwhelming. Okay. Um, and then there's just questions that I think we've opened. You're welcome to ask more questions. Um, and there's, there are some links there to the package documentation and um, a, they've got a paper. So this is obviously their, their official doc, paper documentation and then there's a paper there as well. And as always, this is a license, um, but obviously with R we know it's always open and shareable. Any questions from anyone? Anyone still behind and they'd like to catch up with you, we really don't mind. Okay, Maxine has a question. Um, which of these commands do we just run to set up and which will we need to repeat? So, the, so most of them you will need to repeat each time, but you can, now that you know them, you can just have them as a little chunk and, and just run it as, you know, save it. Is a little file. So the main ones are the git push. Uh, so main ones are your um, the workflow bold, just for the so you can mm -hmm. see your analysis. Then your workflow publish, which will actually commit it um, and bold all your files. So it, it does a git commit at that stage. And then the workflow push, git push, which will actually um, push it to your origin uh, repo on GitHub. Mm. Those are the names. Yeah, so some of these obviously we did, we only had to do one time. So mm -hmm. for example, yeah, the, the configuration, you don't have to do that again. Uh, this you only have to do um, the first time you build this as a workflow R project. This obviously every time you make some changes. This is something that you did because, you re because we were pulling it into a workflow R project. Um, yeah, it was a, a lot also because we were changing it. That's you have to do every time you do a change. There's your publishing. Uh, then if you if you haven't created your repository and it's a new thing, obviously you'd have to do that. But that once it's there, you don't have to do that again. Um, this also is, is once it's connected, it's connected, and then you push it through. So it'll be yeah. this process you'll have to follow for every new project. So every new project that you start, you will have to follow this process. But 
I would start it from scratch. Like here, we tried to take something that was existing and put it in a workflow project. Yeah. But going forward, like I, I like now, I start my project from scratch using the workflow template, and it already sets it up for me. But you'll have to follow mm -hmm. all of the steps for every new project. Um, and the, every time you make changes, though, you'll just need to follow those ones that I mentioned previously. Yeah. Uh, Priyanka had her hand up. Priyanka? So this is a bit more of a technical question, but uh, with the workflow, the checks, there is a check for the setting C. Um, and in this case, as you mentioned, it sort of just uses the dates that you're at. Um, however, nowhere really in the RMD file do you set the seed. So does it just automatically, um, yeah. if a seed is not set, automatically use the date of the day that you run it? Or... Or how yeah. does it conf how does it check that there was a set seed? It's it's, this, it's that it, behind the scenes. Remember that workflow R is trying to take away that burden from you. So the initial slides were showing you what you would have to do if you were diligent and tried to make this a reproducible project. But workflow R now is trying to do the heavy lifting for you. So it sets the seeds. It it captures your session info. It does all of the commit commands to actually get push. Um, so it's doing all of that in the background and it will set the seed to the date that you're currently, when you started the project, but you can also override that. So if you read the, the like FAQs and the documentation, it'll tell you if you have a specific seed that you want to set, you're welcome to set it. Okay, perfect, sense. thank you. Yep. Okay, and then, um, Lisa, you've got a question? So, um, just want to check, when we go and get out, start this whole process, we will start a project, I like to start in GitHub, and then go into R. So I'm assuming you started in GitHub, go to R, and then you put that, I think it was slide 46? Yeah. It, when it says, 48, sorry, when it says directory, you then you're in the project that you're currently working from, I assume. Yes, yeah, so yeah, this is to say that you're in exactly, exactly. That's why you put okay, the doc so there, yeah. yeah. So it's GitHub, start your project, go to R Studio, do the version control, and then you put the flow start and work from there. Yes, so, yeah. so, that, so you, you won't have to do the, because you've already created it, so you can do this straight without going creative because you've already created it. Ah, okay, thank you. Yes. So it'll be still, you'll still have to load the package, so don't forget to load workflow mm -hmm. R and then start when you do the workflow start, it will create the directories for you and then you can start your analysis. So you can save your RMB files in the analysis folder and then go from there. Uh, San Marie, related to a question in the beginning, I tried using workflow and trying to build a flex dashboard in Markdown. Everything went fine until I tried to knit. I asked John on Twitter and he said I can open a query and get over no look at it. So just a heads up if you're building a flex dashboard. What is a flex dashboard? I haven't used that before. Um, so basically, um, I just wanted to, um, so flex dashboard we build in, um, I just wanted to use the workflow R package, but when I tried to knit um, the dashboard, um, only the, the workflow R um, markdown file would knit. So that is an issue. Um, and when I asked John about it, he said that at the moment, Flex dashboard is not working so nicely with uh, Workflow R, but they are looking into it. So okay. if you want to build an, an interactive dashboard, then at the moment, it's not Workflow R is not going to work, which is quite sad. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think it's still relatively new from what I understand. So I think it yeah. will grow. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, okay. Any questions? You want any other questions? Comments? 
anybody that uh, really fell behind and we just like a quick uh, catch up not sure happy to help okay all right well, thank you everyone it was really nice having you you all here and um it was nice to present a workshop that I've done before. Well, that I was a TA and Ian Vavash and we could present to you guys. Um, and we should all share, if we do some workflow or project, we should also just share our experiences. I think it will be nice to see people um, using these things. <laughs> You want to add anything for Bash? Are you happy? Happy. Thanks everyone for coming.